Hi guys, I wanted to let you all know that a month ago today, on the 5th of October, my dad, Dermot Martin, passed away peacefully at home following a short battle with an aggressive version of prostate cancer. He was diagnosed in July of this year and he was three months away from his 70th birthday. Until March of this year, he was playing tennis every week. He was working three days a week. He was watching his beloved Burnley FC get promoted to the Premier League and just dealing with the chaos that comes with having four children in their early 20s. He leaves behind my mum, Sharon, who he was best friends to for nearly 40 years, as well as myself and my siblings, Dermot Jr, Liberty and Amelia. We're completely devastated to lose him. Um, he was the centre of our worlds and as they said about him in the local paper, he was everybody's friend. Dad featured on my YouTube channel only a couple of times, but behind the scenes, he was my biggest cheerleader. He'd ask for a link to my latest vlog pretty much every week, and he'd tell me each time, you've done it again, another cracking vlog. He worked for most of his life as a journalist and a writer, so I knew that as well as working really hard to become the first doctor on the Martin side of the family, he was really proud that I was doing a form of journalism and storytelling myself. I guess it's in my genes. Um, so I hope that you don't mind if today I dedicate this video to him and tell you a little bit about the 70 incredible years he lived and I'll even show you why my channel wouldn't exist without him. So my dad was born on the 11th of January 1954 in Burnley, Lancashire. His dad, Stephen Martin, was a Dunkirk veteran from Belfast who had moved to Burnley after the war. He worked here as a bus driver and this is also where he met my dad's mum, Patricia, uh, one day while she was at work in a hat shop. My dad had two sisters, Maria and Teresa, who actually grew up to be NHS nurses. When my dad was five, his mum noticed that he was walking uh, with a limp and it was around this time he was diagnosed with a paediatric orthopaedic condition called Perthes disease. He spent 18 months in a hospital in Stoke receiving treatment for this and it took his mum two hours on a bus every time to visit him. Luckily the treatment worked and he made a full recovery and later in life went on to play football, run marathons, play tennis. At school, my dad was a high achiever and fascinated by science and the universe around him. He went on to get A-levels in chemistry, physics and maths. He was actually just one of four students studying chemistry A-level at St Theodore's High School. And in 1972, he accepted a place to study chemistry at the University of Southampton, which was on the other side of the country to Burnley. At this time, less than 10% of the UK population went to university, and I would imagine less so from state schools in the north of England. These were the days where you actually got given money to go to university, and my dad had the best time making friends and memories for life. I know he worked hard, but played harder. <laughs> After he died, a university friend wrote to us and said that there was this one tutorial in second year run by a particularly scary professor uh, where students were called up at random to write out steps for synthesising compounds and on one occasion a student was even brought to tears but after the tutorial ended and they made their escape my dad would clap his hands together and say the weekend starts here which might seem like a natural reaction but this particular tutorial took place on a Wednesday morning. One thing that comes across to me in the pictures of my dad as a young man is that he never lost his sense of adventure or fun and the twinkle in his eye that you see in these photos is the same twinkle in his eye he had his whole life. My dad lived so many adventures including, but not limited to, caving expeditions to Peru in the early 1980s, buying a boat and setting sail with his mate neither of them having any prior sailing experience and almost colliding with a ferry, breaking his leg skiing in Canada, taking a solo helicopter ride around New York City, and spending two weeks on Richard Branson's Necker Island, and even running in the very first London Marathon. 
My dad made it through finals, which he credits to his best friend Derek, and graduated from Southampton in 1975. He landed a job in PR on Fleet Street, and it was here that he decided a career in journalism was for him. He moved back to Burnley to work as a reporter on the Burnley Express, and it was here that he first met my mum while she was a media studies student on placement. After a few years, he made his way back down south to work for the Southern Daily Echo and eventually became chief reporter at the Hythe office. We've heard that during his time here, he inspired and mentored many young reporters and loads of ex-colleagues have told me about his ear for a good story. Eventually, he went on to freelance and worked for national papers such as the Financial Times, The Observer and The Telegraph. And in the 90s, he landed a job as editor of the Royal Society of Chemistry's Analysis Europa, and that took him around the world to conferences and tied together his love for chemistry and journalism. And then in 1997, on the day I was born, he was offered a job as a sub-editor at the Southampton Echo, where he ended up working for the next 15 years. As well as a journalist, my dad was a keen sportsman and played tennis, cricket, and for many, many different football teams over the years. Since he's died, I've heard from members of five or six different teams he played for. He was lovingly called Diddy by his teammates. A good midfielder, although he did love to keep the ball to himself, said one teammate from Grasshoppers FC. <laughs> and as if he didn't have enough talents already, my dad was also a brilliant artist. Um, my personal favourite is this sketch he did of me and my mum five days after I was born. On Boxing Day 1986, my dad bumped into my mum at a pub after watching Burnley play, they were both visiting Burnley for Christmas and realised they were both working on papers down south. My mum for Bournemouth Echo and my dad for Southampton Echo. My dad said he was heading back down for the new year and offered my mum a lift back. Mum already had a train ticket but she thought about it for a while and then decided to take him up on the offer. And during a 200 mile car journey back down south, they chatted non-stop, realised they were meant for each other and the rest is history. It wasn't until April 1997, when my dad was 43, that he became a first-time dad. Mum and dad wanted kids, but their careers kept them busy. But from the minute I was born, being a good father was my dad's number one priority. In 1999, my brother Dermot was born, and in 2001, along came twin girls, Amelia and Liberty. And with that, our family of six was complete. If my dad hadn't already had enough adventures, four children under four was certainly a, an adventure of its own. I'm not really sure how they did it, but growing up, we had a lot of fun. My dad was so dedicated to us and I couldn't have asked for anything more from him. I would say more, but I will definitely get upset. In recent years, my dad saw all four of us become university graduates, but we wouldn't have got there without him. Always right behind us and encouraging us to work hard and aim high. He always stayed humble and even in hospital when we were around his bed, a nurse complimented us four kids and he grabbed my mum's hand, lifted her arm in the air and said, she's a genius. As an older man, my dad had continued to have adventures. He owned his own taxi. He was still writing medical articles until earlier this year, and even when he was sick, he was still trying to write this article and get it finished. He visited everywhere from Benidorm to the Bahamas and was best friends to our dog, Macy. After the diagnosis this summer, he made it to my sister's graduation in Warwick. And at the end of August, he received a call saying he needed to go into hospital because of how his liver was being impacted by the cancer. That same day, he'd been for lunch with a school friend, played chess with his tennis partner and picked up my mum from work. Then he drove himself into the hospital and walked onto the ward. 
In recent years, I've been living away from home, and so I'd see him once a month or so, but I'd text or call him most days. He'd be so, so interested in hearing stories from my placements and tell all of his friends about what I was getting up to at uni and sending them my silly internet videos. I don't have any doubts about how proud he was and how much he loved me, because he told me almost every day. My dad crammed a hell of a lot into 70 years, and I'm just sad that he didn't get to have more time, as I know he had so much life left in him. Right now, I don't see how I will ever get over the heartache of losing him, but I know that I need to keep on going for him and live my life like he did. One day, I would like to tell you all a bit more about his prostate cancer battle and tell you how brave he was, but right now, I just want to leave you with some vlogs. One genius idea that my parents had when we were younger was to get a Canon camcorder um, and I think it was probably just to film all of the fun that was happening and the Christmases and the birthdays. We didn't really ever go back and watch the tapes, they just sat in a box. And when my dad was unwell, I actually went and dug them out. And as painful as it is to watch it all back, I'm just so, so glad we've captured the memories and I have his voice. One thing I noticed while I was watching them back was that my dad was a natural at vlogging and this channel really wouldn't exist without him because he was there narrating every sports day and Christmas and I guess that through this I picked up a need to document everything in my life. So I will leave you now with a few clips of my wonderful dad. Some clips from his vlogging days and some from mine. Um, and the final clip was filmed this year on his 69th birthday where I asked him a big question that I didn't realise would be so significant. I just want to leave you with these clips and to tell you to remember to squeeze your parents tight if you're lucky enough to have them. And make sure to appreciate every Christmas, birthday or silly meet-up because you really never do know what's round the corner. Yeah, it's recording, yeah. This is Lydia and she's going to take the cake in because today is Daddy's birthday. And Daddy is 50. Yeah. Yeah. Happy birthday to you. And this is this is Amelia. And this is Liberty. And that is Donna. Yes, and Lydia has got the cake. Yes. Happy birthday, Daddy. Two, three. Silly hat. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got my family here looking very, very beautiful. Mummy's waving, Liddy's just waving. She's got a new coat that she got from Father Christmas. And the twins are looking away at the other children. Dermot is very, very quiet. Why are you so quiet? Liddy's now going to the loo, so it's bye bye from her and hello from the twins. Don't be long, Mummy. Don't be long. Yes. Mommy's doing the picture. Yeah. Uh, uh, One, two, three. Amelia, come in the picture. Jingle bells. 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 Jingle The 9th of January 2005 and we're in our uh, lounge and we've just had the floor sanded. Holly, yeah. And this is Daddy. Wiping his face. Yes, and he's been up for a long time now. Yes. And uh, and, th and there's Liberty, Let's yes. Get on the camera. And where's... Oh, Spider there's Man. Amelia. Can we catch you on the camera? There's Amelia. Me and Dermot. And your nose is sticking out your eye. <laughs> and Dermot is Spider-Man. Uh, 30th of July, 2005. Karen arriving. Bosch and Bex together, here we are, at the playing field. This is Posh, and I, I am Bex. Hello, Daddy. Alright, you can get Lydia on there now. Where's Lydia? That's Lydia with the pink and white hat on. Right. Yeah. First sprint race. <laughs> I'm talking to the camera. Oh, are you? So, trying to find myself maybe bearings are, you know? What year is it? What year is it? 2005? It's going to be a close finish. Oh. <laughs> it's 
some big girls out there. There's a bit of a blanket finish, that. She finished about seven, I think. But they're all about the same pace. Yeah, they were. She did well. There's some tall girls. You've got the, there, the big yeah, girls, you've got, you've got no chance of it. Oh, <laughs> have you? Yeah. Things like that. Some of them are like nearly as tall as me. I know. We forget, don't we, how small we really are. <laughs> We've got the smallness gene. That's it. Hello, Amelia. Happy Christmas. From the city, Westbourne Park Road. Having a sit down. First one this morning. <laughs> Why are there no aspirins in the jungle? I don't know. Because of the paracetamol. Well, that's bad jokes. Here we go again. A girl. What do you call a girl with an electric fire stuck on her head? Uh. An eater. <laughs> you get worse. Do news for you. Let's go through now to Donald. Donald, can you hear me? We're going to interview Dermot Martin the world famous artist on bread. Sounds extremely interesting, Donald. Let's talk to Dermot Martin now then. Or brown bread. Brown for me? Brown which? Cheapest sardine and tomato spread that you can buy in Waitrose. How much, how much bread do you have a week? Okay. Two loaves on Tuesday, one loaf on Wednesday, and then I give myself a break for the rest of the week. Your favorite brand <laughs> Cut. What's, Cut. Your... <laughs> What's your favourite brand of bread? That bakery in Wimborne. I can't remember the name of it now, but your mother might know. Our mother might know. Oh, God, I'll get it wrong. Congratulations, Dermot. Here's your bread. That's very kind of you. I shall savour this between now and the weekend. Uh, thank you very much for all the kind viewers. I'm just going to pass this on to us. Excuse me, what are you up to there? I'm filming. Not Easter, I'm filming. It's not Easter. I know. If you damage that, that thing, you're in big trouble. I'm going to the house. Think about it. And when you finish with it, put it back where you know where it is. Properly. Okay. Um, yeah, October 24th, 2006. It's late at night. Before I uh, due to uh, take part in the first strike involving the Echo at Southampton for about... Since 1979, I think. Um, it's all repaired. And, um, I'm supposed to be doing bigger duty in the morning, so uh, here's hoping the weather's fine and uh, people uh, are keen and enthusiastic to uh, pursue uh, what they feel is right. I'm still in the high street. People are uh, generally taking note of what we're saying, walking on and enjoying the uh, lovely weather. We've uh, got about five pickets of sad whiskey, and you know, with little leaflets. And uh, it's ironic that we're outside the old Echo building, but there's no sign of the Echo building, of course, these days, because uh, it's turned into this uh, mega store. Big smile! Yay! The old Echo! Lewis Hamilton just getting a bit, a bit nervous before the big race. And here's Jensen Button, uh, Jensen S Button. Clearing her eyesight, yeah, ready, looking for the big one. Going to line up together before we start. Get together on the start line. Yes, and I'll do a bit of the interview here. Yeah. You can pause. I know. Uh, so, Robbie Blake, born. Oh, I just put the cap on. Okay, but. Yeah, that's alright. Right, hang on. What is that? It's called um, whiskey. I can't eat whiskey. You can't no, eat it. Why not? No, it's burnt off anyway. It burns away. Here we go. Yeah, look at that girl, get it, get it, on the This is Christmas 2000. This is Christmas 2000, isn't it? The 25th of December, the day that Jesus was born. Another day over. What is that? A flaming Christmas pudding. All right, that'll do. We're not moving around. Move around then, don't move around. Wait, no, wait, video. Is that so this is what you've got to put up with, with these four. Oh no, Great, you're isn't it? killing me! Hey! Hey! <laughs> Welcome to find a parking spot. Welcome to today's vlog. Today we're going to watch the Mighty Clarets play Southampton. <laughs> Lydia's joining us. She hasn't been to a Burnley game in over 15 years. Is that true? It is true, yes. 1-0, 2005. 
Yeah. Yeah. I can buy, Adi, I can buy equalizer from a Graham branch. Won this pass. I don't remember any of it. I do. But if you best the Let's go and get some cash. Thinking. Anybody got cash? Welcome to today's match day vlog. Anybody got cash? <laughs> <laughs> Now, do you need to introduce yourself? All right, done it, Martin. Senior. <laughs> Spent 30 years as a journalist. Uh, no, you need to tell everyone <laughs> you're a Southampton, Southampton grad. That's it. That's got to mention that. Uh, why do I need to mention that? Because that's going to fall off. It's, it's a it's university vlog. Is it? Oh, it's oh yeah, I'm I, I'm a chemistry graduate, 1975. I'm a the, one of the most uh, outstanding years for chemistry ever known by Southampton University. Facts. Facts. Three. Facts. There were three Nobel Prize winners waiting to be awarded for that year. No left turn here, no left turn. No left turn. Okay, we're going to see my old house. Here we are. Yeah, eight pound cash. Eight pounds? Yeah. We haven't got any cash at the moment. Can we get... Uh, is it cash point? Yeah, the card machine is okay. Oh, you can pay by card. All right, okay. Just, just reverse or just park over there. Okay. Next to that. Thank That's you. One. Yeah, wonderful. See? It's lovely. That was really nice. <laughs> da, you so, you're so happy. Home's under power. I love you too, Benjamin. Um, heavy tiles on the roof. And they started to sag, so the rain was coming into the attic. So I had to get a new, a new roof on it. It looks a bit. Could be like a little. What year did you live here? What year? Yeah. Um, 82 to 85, 86. 1882 to 1886. But in that room there is where I had the first computer in there. No way. What was it? Amstrad. He's like a young Bill Gates. Yeah. <laughs> Working out his garage. Printer. So much promise. Dot, 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 dot matrix printer. I don't know what that is. Uh, way ahead of his time. <laughs> yeah. Trendsetter. Where did you work when you lived here? Um, somebody in the window. Somebody there is somebody in the window and you just got... <laughs> Airport, Airport security. security. <laughs> well, we got um, score predictions today. Uh, um, not, not a good feeling. <laughs> in the stadium. Oh, in the stadium. All right. All right. Garden. Do you want to tell everyone where we are? Go on, give a little, give a little welcome to Corf Castle. It's been a long time since this castle was wrecked by weak females. I think it was the women that caused the trouble. They all went to Ikea on the same day and that's what they came back with. Country roads. Yes. And I wanted to do. You wanted to do you like pina, pina colada. colada. But Mum's just doing her makeup, ready for some photos. You look a bit like a musician today. Yeah. It's the jacket and the glasses. The, the glasses. Yeah. If you um, don't be quiet, I'll have to subject you to a yellow submarine. Oh, not that one. You did that one in there. <laughs> <laughs> you should go over this. And 11,000 graduands have passed through here at this stadium in the last few days. Do you work for the University of Southampton? Ticket. No, no. Open it all. Open it all. I'm going to be shocked here, aren't I? Is it my life story? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what is one thing you've learned in 69 years of life? In 69 One thing? Yeah. 
Try to avoid women at all costs. He's misogynist, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to come out really bad? Yeah, probably. Maybe, should we try that again? Take two. Take two. What is one piece of advice you could provide to the viewers after 69 years of life? Find yourself a wonderful woman to be your partner. That's, <laughs> That's a great idea. That's a great idea. You always told us how proud you were, but I wonder if it ever did occur. You made us who we are today. Your impact on us, we can't downplay. We're broken hearted, you couldn't stay. But I know your voice and what you'd say. You tell us all we've not to be sad. And this is why we love you, Dad.